And so we're about to move into the Edmund S. Muskie Award presentation. And with the, Muskie, I mean, uh, the Muskie Award is for our pro bono award to a TIFFS member. And to introduce our Muskie Award winner is Maureen Mulligan. Thank you. fellow Boston lawyer, Erin Higgins. Erin is a partner at Con Cavanaugh, Rosenthal Fleischen Ford, and she is an extraordinary lawyer who is a leader not only in her firm, but in the Boston legal community. But it's Erin's commitment to use her skills and talents as a lawyer to provide pro bono legal services to women who are victims of abuse, rape, and domestic assault that moved the Law and Public Service Committee to give her the Muskie Award this evening. In 2005, Erin began volunteering as an attorney advocate at the Victim Rights Law Center. Now, the Victim Rights Law Center serves the legal needs of sexual assault victims by providing legal representation in the civil context. The center provides legal representation to victims of rape and sexual assault to help them rebuild their lives. Now, I'm going to tell you just about three very uh, short examples of some of the types of cases and some of the types of clients that Erin has had and that she has helped and assisted in this capacity. Erin represented a woman who was raped by a co-worker and assisted her in negotiating workplace accommodations until the criminal trial of the alleged rapist had been concluded. The company could not fire the alleged rapist until he was convicted of a crime and as a result the victim who needed her job was faced with arriving at work each day and having to face her rapist again and again. But through Aaron's work, the company instituted procedures to keep the parties separate, which allowed the woman to continue working in a job that she very much needed. Aaron has represented rape victims who are in the United States without proper documentation to assist them in obtaining U visas so they can testify against their assailants in assault cases without fear of being deported. This work serves a very vulnerable population. One of Aaron's longest running cases was when she represented a, a victim of assault who was raped and almost killed by her employer. The rapist refused to abide by the temporary restraining orders issued by the court, and he continued to harass the woman that he raped. After the rapist failed on multiple occasions to abide by the temporary restraining order, Aaron sought a permanent injunction with a wide geographical area in an effort to keep the alleged rapist away from his former employee. And as you know out there, all of us as lawyers, permanent injunctions, including location restrictions, are very difficult to obtain. Unlike a TRO, they require an evidentiary hearing. Erin was successful in getting a permanent injunction preventing the assailant from entering the town where the woman lived. And this gave her the freedom, the freedom to go to the local coffee shop, to meet her friends out for dinner, without the fear of being followed, potentially harassed, or harmed by her assailant. Erin has a full-time caseload of paying clients, but she is also the pro bono partner in her law firm. And in that role, she supervises and advising assist, advises associates who are doing pro bono representation. In a world of overworked lawyers who are always looking for extra time, Erin's work encouraging young lawyers to engage in pro bono work and then taking the time to mentor them in that work is an important contribution to instilling in a younger generation of lawyers the importance of pro bono representation and in providing them an opportunity to do so. Encouraging pro bono work is good, we all do that, but mentoring, sponsoring, and providing advice so that young lawyers can actually engage in pro bono service is a commitment to serving an underserved population. If this were not enough, she has also served on the board of the Women's Bar Foundation since 2002 and was its president in 2009. The Women's Bar Foundation advances social and economic justice by providing low-income women and their children with legal representation. She serves on the board of the Appleseed Center for Law and Justice. This is a national organization that advocates for social change. The focus recently for this group has been on providing public education for homeless children. And Erin was appointed by the justices of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts to the Court's Committee on Pro Bono Services. For most people, having a full-time job, parenting children, and belonging to one organization is enough. But Erin has been tirelessly working to use her advocacy skills to assist those who cannot afford to pay for legal representation. 
She has done this through her own work representing clients, through encouraging the next generation of lawyers to participate in providing direct pro bono legal services, and by her leadership as the president of the Women's Bar Foundation. Erin's generosity to reach out to others in many different capacities is a gift to the legal community. Erin leads by example, and her strong advocacy and commitment on behalf of her pro bono clients exemplifies the type of lawyer whom we all want to be part of our profession. So before I call Erin up for this award, I'd like to recognize her husband, Doug, and her children, Harry, Dennis, and Kate, who are with her this evening. And I'd also like to send a special shout out to Erin's dad, who is also an attorney, who is very proud of his daughter's work in the profession that they share. So please join me in congratulating Erin Higgins for all of her outstanding work in providing access to justice for those who would otherwise go without representation. for honoring me, for honoring me with this award, which is named for one of New England's own, Senator Edmund Muskie. As many of you know, Senator Muskie had a distinguished political career, but this award recognizes his lifelong commitment to our highest calling as lawyers, a commitment to public service, to representing the most vulnerable members of our society. And I know that the ABA and the TIP section and all of you in this room are committed to that same goal. As Maureen mentioned, most of my pro bono work has been done with the Victim Rights Law Center and the Women's Bar Foundation, both in Boston. And I want to start today by recognizing a woman who's sitting at my table, Stacy Malone, the Executive Director of the Victim Rights Law Center. Thank you, Stacy. down from her vacation house in Vermont for tonight's dinner, so I really want to thank her for that. The Victim Rights Law Center and the Women's Bar Foundation recruit, train, and mentor volunteer attorneys who provide free legal assistance to low-income victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. These clients truly fall into the category of the most vulnerable. They have been subject to physical and or mental abuse. They are fearful. And I think as a lawyer in private practice, that for me was the hardest part about learning to work with these particular clients, was they are fearful. They may be undocumented. They may not speak English. And probably hardest to appreciate is that they may have no source of income or shelter other than the very person who is abusing them. For these clients, a volunteer attorney can make a tremendous difference. And I thought I would talk tonight about just one of the clients that I've represented. This was actually an interesting referral because it came from both the Victim Rights Law Center and the Women's Bar Foundation. This particular client, whom I'll call Mary, was an illegal immigrant from Haiti. She came to the United States from Haiti with her young infant after her husband and her brother were killed in gang violence. She had to leave her three older children behind in Haiti because she could not afford to pay a smuggler doc for documentation for all of them. When she came to the United States with her infant, she knew no one in the United States. But she had the name and the number of a supposed family friend in Boston. She traveled to Boston, contacted this friend, 
and soon entered into what started as a romantic relationship with him. Very quickly, the relationship became violent, and Mary entered into a kind of semi-slavery that I think for all of, us, all of us in this room is so difficult to appreciate. She had no money, she had no source of income, and the man who was abusing her told her that any attempt she made to report the abuse to the police would result in him reporting her to authorities and having her deported. The situation became even worse after Mary became pregnant with her abuser's child. After she had the baby, her abuser told her that he would have her deported if he ever tried to leave with his child. So she virtually felt trapped in a home that she was never allowed to leave. After a particularly bad episode of violence, Mary did leave, but she left her baby behind because of her abuser's threats. She made her way to the Victim Rights Law Center and the Women's Bar Foundation, and she was referred to our firm. My firm represented Mary for over four years. Our first step for Mary was getting her a special kind of visa, and Maureen mentioned this in her introduction, a special kind of visa called a U visa. This was a relatively new type of visa when Mary came to my firm. And it's a visa for victims of sexual assault who are prepared to testify against their accusers. It's a special kind of visa that allows them to have temporary legal status in the United States so that they don't have to fear being deported if they're cooperating with the police. Once we got Mary a U visa, she had legal status in this country, and that made all of the difference. She was able to get a job. She was quickly certified to uh, work as a home health care aide. She got a job. She got an apartment. And all of a sudden, she was able to leave the homeless shelter she was living in with her, the son that she had brought with her to the United States. We also were able to get derivative U visas, derivative from her visa, derivative U visas for her child that she brought with her to the United States, as well as her three older children still living in Haiti. And that was certainly an adventure, working with the consulate officials in Haiti, who had never heard of a U visa. And we spent a tremendous amount of time actually looking for the kids' birth certificates, only to discover that they had been destroyed in the 2010 Haitian earthquake. At the same time, we were in constant contact with the U.S. immigration authorities to try to get these kids into the country. And what I learned about dealing with USCIS is that it is a matter of sheer persistence. And I assigned an associate in my office to call them every single day. And that's what we did. And I think at the end, they gave you visas to everyone in Mary's family simply so that we would stop calling them. <laughs> At the same time, we filed an action on Mary's behalf in the Massachusetts Family and Probate Court so that she could make some kind of custody arrangement with respect to her youngest child who had stayed with her abuser. And after quite a long period of time, because Mary had, of course, very limited history, both of being in the United States legal, legally and a very limited history of um, being able to work in the United States legally, we were able to obtain a custody arrangement for Mary, where she was able to see her youngest child via exchanges that took place at the local police station. So Mary never had to actually interact with her former abuser. At the end of our representation of Mary, she had gathered all of her children together under one roof, and they all were able to live, work, and study legally in the United States. The day that Mary brought her children into the office to meet me was really one of my truly great days as a lawyer. And I still keep their family photograph on my desktop at work to remind me that while my billable work is very interesting and challenging, the really important work that we all do as lawyers is the work that we do for free. Thank you.
uh, Maureen already mentioned them, but I did want to, before I, as I conclude my remarks, mention my husband, Doug Rosner, who's a bankruptcy partner at Goldston and Stores, another friend in Boston. And my three children, Harry, Kate, and Dennis, who are here with us tonight. Hoping that listening to my remarks, they are all thinking about how to incorporate public service into their own lives. <laughs> I also want to thank my law firm, Con Kavanaugh, Rosenthal, Peich, and Ford. We're a small law firm, but in some ways we try to act like a big law firm. And pro bono service is definitely one of those. Uh, one of the things that we've focused on as a law firm, in addition to bar activities. Um, and finally, um, Maureen mentions my dad, which I really appreciate. Um, my parents would have loved to have been here tonight. My dad is pretty ill. But I do want to mention my dad because he is a solo practitioner in the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania. And um, I really became a lawyer because I saw how much my dad loved being a lawyer. And he still is a lawyer. Uh, and as my mother would tell you, all of my father's clients are pro bono clients. <laughs> <laughs> Even the ones who initially were supposed to pay. <laughs> and finally, I would like to say thank you again to the tip section for honoring me with this very special award.